The public has a long-held fascination with detectives. Detectives see a side of life the average person is never exposed to. In this podcast series, I Catch Killers with Gary Jubelin, I'll be interviewing a whole range of people you come across as a detective, including police, bad guys and victims. I spent 34 years as a cop. For 25 of those years, I was catching killers. That's what I did for a living. I was a homicide detective. I'm no longer just interviewing bad guys. Instead, I'm taking the public into the world in which I operated. The guests I selected have amazing stories from all sides of the law. The interviews are raw and honest, just like the world they inhabited. No one who steps into the world of crime comes out unchanged. Join me now while I take you into this world. This episode of I Catch Killers contains conversations that some listeners may find confronting or triggering. Discretion is advised. Welcome back to I Catch Killers with part two of our discussion with Dr. Sarah Yule. Sarah is an immensely experienced forensic psychologist. In fact, she was the first forensic psychologist employed by the police within Australia to provide forensic psychological expertise to operational police. If you listen to part one, you got a real sense of why Sarah was my go-to person on difficult investigations. Those skills and the insight that she brought to an investigation certainly enhanced our ability to track down offenders and solve cases. In part two, we're going to talk about some of the cases I worked on with Sarah whilst we were both employed with the New South Wales Police. We're going to talk about the William Tyrrell investigation, which is the disappearance of a three-year-old boy on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. We will be mindful that the investigation is still unsolved and currently before the coroner. But before we talk about that case, we're going to talk about the Matthew Leveson case. Matt disappeared on the 23rd of September 2007. It took 10 years for Matt's family before they could recover Matt's body, buried in bushland in the National Park at Waterfall, south of Sydney. We found Matt's body only after an exhaustive coronial investigation in which intricate legal agreements were reached where the person who buried Matt's body was offered immunity from prosecution if he directed us to where Matt's body was. This may seem an easy task, but we were dealing with a person like Michael Atkins. He was Matt's partner at the time of his disappearance. He had denied any involvement in Matt's disappearance for 10 years, including at his own murder trial after he was charged with murdering Matt. But before we discuss that, it's important to say Michael Atkins has not been convicted of any crime related to Matthew's disappearance. He was acquitted at that trial. Sarah, can you tell me about your involvement in Matthew Leveson's case? Yes, um, Matt's disappearance was an example of an investigation where my contribution to um, discussions with the strike force really evolved through various stages of that investigation and there were different needs at different times. And so, as you say, we'd had that um, previous investigative involvement um, at the earlier stages of your reinvestigation into Matt's disappearance and then the focus was for the inquest. So I remember providing some advice um, to counsel assisting the coroner um, to to give some sense of, um, because, as, because they were developing their questioning strategy. And so it was, it was in relation to um, what might motivate this person to reveal what it was believed that he knew. Because we had Michael... Atkins in the witness box at the coroner's court where a section 61 certificate had been issued. So you were advising the council assisting on the best way to approach the questioning of uh, Michael Atkins? Yes. And again, it's a, it's a process that's very dynamic, but I was giving my understanding, for example, on um, the nature of the relationship that they'd had and some um, personality features that I felt had emerged through the information that had been gathered by the investigation about that. Um, and and it was extremely challenging because you know as as you've alluded to all of those legal parameters were kind of different to what we're near, we're normally dealing with on a on a uh, on an investigation. Um, so and the legal side of it is not something I'm typically involved with at all. So that was a steep learning curve for me to sort of understand. And and, and I was certainly um, attending the inquest with yourself and the team, um, attending the search site as well, because there were a number of different um, points of, of psychological input. And I do remember when was being discussed about different deals that were having to be considered and were eventually made um, in terms of no um, legal consequence for Michael Atkins uh, should he reveal 
um, the location of Matt's body. And while I was trying to get my head around what that meant on the legal side of things and and I recall being part of those discussions and it was challenging too because you know in terms of the the discussions that the team and the council assisting the coroner were having with um, Mr Atkins team they weren't always discussions I could be part of so I was sort of having to assess the information in in a secondary nature as well but I I recall discussing with yourself and um, Pat Sadie, who was who's fantastic. I've come across him in a number of inquests, and he was um, representing the police or the commissioner. And I remember discussing that I can understand the purpose of offering a deal where he doesn't suffer those negative consequences of of charges, for example. However, he was already not suffering those negative consequences by not revealing any information. So for me, and that's that's where that <laughs> carrot versus the stick um, comment came from for me, I suppose, because that's kind of, you know, it's kind of, it, it's saying, all right, there, there won't be that negative consequence, but nor would there be if he didn't reveal the information. So what was actually going to motivate him to reveal the information mm. in the first place? And... Um, you know, he there was considerable media attention about him and, and those things would have been difficult for him as well. But it just wasn't enough to compel him. And I remember having that discussion. Now, I don't have the legal expertise. That's not my role to say what that should look like. And I guess in that way, it's similar to um, in a in a, a more traditional police investigation where I might sort of say these might be the motivators you're wanting to tap into and it's up to the detectives to work out what's um, legally permissible and what they would actually look like in practice. So I remember having those discussions and I remember um, Pat Sadie mentioning about um, if he uh, if he purges himself on the yep. stand, then there would be a negative consequence for that. And then his avoidance of that yep. um, might be the motivating factor to get him to speak. So, you know, and that was a fantastic um, legal twist as well. So it was and about compelling him, giving him a reason to actually speak, not just avoid consequences for it, but actually and, disclose. And that's on the back of you working closely with myself and the uh, the rest of the team, um, Scott Craddock and mm. uh, others. Uh, for over 12 months, really getting an insight yeah. into uh, um, the person that we're looking at for involvement in uh, in Matt's uh, death, Absolutely. Uh, Mike Lankins. So with that and breaking it down, and it is a complex thing and it's, uh, we, we could do an episode on it just on the complexities mm. of the, the legal issues. But what it came down to was that Michael Atkins got in the witness box and perjured himself um, dur- whilst giving evidence and then an offer was made that... Uh, would give him indemnity from prosecuting him for perjury if he revealed to us where the body was. Then we have at two o'clock in the morning, him describing to us, ad- admitting that, yes, I, I did bury Matt's body. This is 10 years after the offence. Mm. And then driving, uh, being directed by him as we're driving him down to uh, the National Park um, at um, you know, three o'clock in the morning. Mm. And he's looking around to an area that he hadn't seen for 10 years since the time that uh, he buried Matt's body and tried to identify it, looking at um, certain areas, the curvature of the road, that, that type mm. of thing. The problem we had from an investigator's point of view, and this is where I relied heavily on on you, is is he lying to us? Um, because he's been denying it for 10 years that he had any involvement in it, so clearly he has told untruths before. Mm. Is he just pretending this is where I've, I've buried the uh, buried the body to appease us or appease, appease the, uh, the courts mm. and uh, that he's met his obligations? We had to. It, it's not easy finding a body in the national park, and there was mm. a lot of resources, um, you know, a, a physical a man resources, everything that goes into looking for the, the body. The area that he first identified to us, we searched for the fortnight, had no joy. We then went to another area that he might have been uh, said it's similar, but not the area he first thought. Then we came back to the first area. During that whole time. From my point of view, I felt the pressure. Am I being led along by someone who's telling an untruth? Or is this person telling the truth and we just haven't found the body? And so I relied heavily Mm. on you. And you interpreted how the confession that he made um, Mm. to us and whether you believed him. And and what was your thoughts on that? 
Well, certainly, and, and as you say, there, there were some proven untruths previously, so we had to keep that in mind as well, but also that, um, you know, his part of the, of the deal was um, that Matt needed to be found. And so it was this constant battle, which wasn't easy for me to interpret either, nor, nor in our discussions together. And so what also factored into that process was analysis in terms of typical patterns in in body disposal as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And it sort of ties in a little bit with some of the geographic profiling stuff you mentioned before as well. I mean, some of those um, professionals have, you know, detailed statistical programs that they rely on. But when you look at it in terms of just logical behaviour and and it ties a lot into just the behavioural understanding there as well, people will often choose areas that they're they're more familiar with but also put a bit of distance um, you know, because they're also trying to not be detected. Uh, but also we're looking at the difficulties of um, disposing of a person, a, a, a body, um, and that somebody doesn't want to or can't carry a, a person for kilometres, you know, into the bush. So I recall every day when we were down there, it was a reassessment. It really yeah. was such a moving beast and it was a reassessment of, you know, really feeling that I remember in that first sight, I remember the discussions about, look, he, you know, Matt's more likely to be if he's here. And it's always, and yeah. it comes down to if he's here, where is it most logical? And, and again, what ties back to what do we empirically know about body disposal patterns? And I always strongly felt if he's here, he's within, you know, the 10 to 15 of either side. Yeah. And I recall that initially... We were led by Atkins to a spot that was directly forward and I think it was something like 35 metres away and that, yeah. that that really didn't feel right. But again, it comes down to this ties in with deception, assessment of deception. Sorry, I always fall over those words. Assessment of deception. It's not as simplistic as saying, is this person lying or not? And that's not what it's about, at least from, from when I was having involvement in that kind of ass- assessment. It's about where are the inconsistencies in this information where are the gaps in detail what where where is it highlighting and you're looking for all other reasons that might explain what may seem to be deceptive but sometimes that's just a leap people can make and and like when we're talking i think you said 35 meters where he said he disposed the body Mm. but we're also talking about him pulling up at night in a stressful situation walking into uh without a torch walking into um bushland Mm. and his perception might be it was 35 meters but as as you've said and that's my experience i've found with uh serial killers and uh where or generally where body bodies are dumped is that it's very difficult to take a body a long way into uh into into the bushland that's right there might be considerable travel by vehicle but then on foot it's a different you know the part that is on foot is is typically much closer and also i do remember with that site there was a little bit of a drop off from the road so in terms of visibility from passing cars there was a bit of coverage mm. there as well uh, we were also looking you know we were all looking at and i had other um you know crime scene experts as well and um you know steve horn was out there as well we were yep. benefiting from his knowledge in terms of the different types of soil i mean this really you know when you look at a multidisciplinary approach to you know bring in any and all expertise that you can because something might might flag it and ultimately um you know where he was found was was close to the road within that that mm. 10 to 15 meters and and on that side and that's what we all you know and a lot of it is yes you sort of intuitively feel that but that's also supported by some of the research so it was not you're sort of looking as well when you're trying to assess the likelihood of someone's account being truthful you're assess- it's not necessarily all or nothing either it's not that it's a complete lie or it's a complete truth mm. you're looking for the different components and and you know i think that was sort of a facet of his personality as well that he and that was quite a challenging and shocking thing to deal with as well that there really was a lack of care or knowledge about um where he was and I remember one time I mentioned uh, when I had cause to speak to him briefly um, and I had cause to to mention the name of the road that that site was off and he said oh that's what it's called is it and I and you know that Mm. to sort of think you don't even know the name of the road where you've enacted well, it, this behaviour. Well, it, it, was, it was perplexing <laughs> myself, and that's why I, I was relying heavily on you, but uh, also Scott Craddock, who a uh, shout-out to Scott. Yes, a very, absolutely. Yeah, a brilliant detective. Mm. Um, and, yeah, Scott was present uh, with me the whole time when we were talking to um, Michael Atkins, and we would sit down and go, is he telling us the truth? And we're using every ounce of 
intuition we had as a detective and we're, we're thinking there's nothing in uh, what he said or how he's doing it that makes us think he's not telling us the truth. He's genuinely trying to find him. There was, there was a counter view because I, I was feeling immense pressure from uh, within the organisation and uh, other areas where uh, people are just saying he's just stringing you along. And uh, mm. I, I'm, I'm the one sort of signing off on uh, excavating the National Park. Sure, I oh, know it was it was a massive, a massive so, thing. But that ties in. I think. Sorry, just just while I think of it, that also ties in with that evaluation of of one behaviour. And and does that mean option A or option B? Yeah. And and yes, that was a very dismissive and sort of cold way for him to approach an attitude as to where he, as we ultimately confirmed, yep. he had buried a body. Um, he'd buried Matt, but. Um, when you that's where the psychology again is looking at it and going is that because it's the wrong place is that because he's um not telling us the truth and he's deliberately leading us somewhere wrong or is it because that is the facet of his personality and his particular attitude to this behavior yeah. and doesn't care and that's why he really is genuinely unsure yeah. because it's something that he's compartmentalized and, and I, I think it's fair think to say about. yourself myself scott we're all of the view that uh, he was telling the truth um, to us, it, as in as best he could. He was providing us, uh, making the best effort he could to uh, tell us where Matt's body was. But In terms of the location, yeah. We, we tried a couple of things, which is a little bit unusual, but the, and this is where on the difficult investigations you've got to try, uh, try different things. Mm. One of the things that we tried, and I know I, I discussed it with you and we consulted on it, was about um, getting a mannequin as strange as that sounds, and uh, putting it in a boot of a car. And uh, there was one night that uh, we drove um, him down to the location, the general area of the location, and then uh, with his legal representatives that were um, more than appropriate the, the whole time during the course of the investigation, and uh, dropped it on him that, uh, where do you think? And he, he would mention and he would walk into the area where he thought the body was um dumped and then uh, we sprung it on him that we've got a mannequin in the the boot of the car Mm. that weighed I think it was 85 kilos the type of mannequin that the rescue squad carry around training Mm. and said show us how you move the body because that's similar to carrying a uh, a, a, a dead body and uh, on the back of that it made him check himself and think maybe I didn't carry it that far so that was one of the one of the methods that we used yes realizing just how difficult it is because I I had discussed with yourself and Scott about when you are taking him back to the scene to try and um, trigger some of those memories have it as as um, realistic or aligned to the situation he was Mm. in in terms of you know time of night and and you know so in terms of of, he could really see how much light there was or wasn't at that yep. time, and so and 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 uh, making it as similar to the actual event as possible, and, and that's so you suggested the mannequin. That was a fantastic idea in terms of yeah. Then he can really feel the weight and yeah. and what that would actually have taken, and that really did help in um, honing and his detail. Another strategy at your suggestion was um, that you were concerned, even if the and. You said to me, make sure that you're not judgmental when you're dealing with him. And mm. uh, uh, so he felt comfortable and felt comfortable talking about what had happened. So we did that. But you also made the suggestion, just the mere fact that you're a police officer and you're there in the vicinity, he might feel intimidated by that. So we went to um, some people might say the extraordinary um, uh, steps, but uh, it was a- again at, um, in discussion with you and you came up with it. If we could access the actual car, that uh, he used to dispose of uh, of Matt's body. And uh, uh, Matt's parents were kind enough to, they still had the car in their possession, were kind enough to lend us the car, as troubling as that would have been for them, Um, Mm. Mark and and Faye. Well, I I think you're giving me too much credit there. I don't think I made that suggestion about the car. But in terms of, yeah, in those discussions that we had, and we very much had them with Mark and Faye along the way, in terms of this needs to be as... Similar as possible to that night, yeah. and with the car still being available, and uh, and so I don't think that was me, but yeah, that that well, suggestion was, was a, made. It was a team, team, and it was team effort that's right, in, in the discussions. Daily discussions. But yeah. then we actually gave uh, gave him the car for a whole weekend and yep. said, "We want you driving around okay. anywhere that you yep. think. Go on a hunch, whatever. At the top night, go around, drive, and then bring the car back to us in uh, two days' time." So that yep. was a fairly strange thing, but. The fact that he did do it 
and he came back and still maintained that the area where he first told us that he believed he um, dumped Matt's body was the area where Matt's body should be. Yes. That sort of reaffirmed to us. But then we even went one further step. We got uh, hypnosis and, and people you know, sometimes seem surprised when we rely on uh, the hypnosis to help with criminal investigations. I've done it a few times. There's legal uh, parameters mm. that you must um, stick with and basically anything that comes after someone's been hypnotised can't be used as evidence because there's a thought that it may be contaminated. But you had a, you were present um, uh, when we organised for the hypnot- hypnotist to do his stuff. And the way you described it, because I look at the hypnotist or I think the public look at the hypnotist is make you run around the room like a chicken, that type of thing, when they click yeah. their fingers or dangle their watch. But my understanding... From what you've told me, it's just creating an environment where there's no other distractions. Do you want to? Sure, I can clarify. I guess some of the because I understand the terminology you're using, and that's that's um, what most you know police would would refer to it as. And think of it. for me, hypnosis is not something I would advocate for. And as you say, that has has can have significant legal. Um, <laughs> implications in a typical investigation and also um, can contaminate witness evidence. So, but it was talked about in that, that's layman's terms for it, but what what we were actually doing then, and and it was your suggestion because you'd had positive um, outcomes in other cases, what it actually was, and as you talk, you talk about that, yeah, dance around the room like a chicken. If people recall some of those um, show TV shows where there's a hypnotist and they're there, uh, that's all about suggestibility, and that's absolutely what we didn't want in this case. In fact, it was the opposite. We wanted um, for a skilled clinician, and um, so it was a, a clinical psychologist. So whilst it was colloquially called hypnosis, because that's the police understanding, it's actually um, uh, assisting in the person uh, to be relaxed as 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 much as possible so they're taken through relaxation and then it's a a a detailed cognitive interview is really what it's doing so when you think about it it's actually the opposite to that suggestibility we don't want any suggestibility we want to get back to um, extracting as much truthful recall as we possibly can so um so that was put in place and um that was was Allowing Michael Atkins, I suppose, to really be um, transported in his thinking back to uh, feeling like it's real time and some of um, his responses that we observed watching that cognitive interview um, demonstrated that that was, you know, he was thinking through it as though it was happening at the time. And it's with all of the knowledge about the fallibility of human memory as well. We know that it's not going to recapture a complete picture. It's not going to be like playing a videotape. It's talked about quite frequently about there are little pockets of information that may emerge and we were just hopeful there might be a pocket that might emerge that either solidified that original location or indicated something that was totally different but the information that was coming from that process was pretty consistent with um and also those you know doing that kind of process you know we we didn't have the legal the potential legal um ramifications because this wasn't going to be going to a criminal trial or something like that so we, we had nothing to lose and it was about you know, we've already, you'd already extracted statements from him already, already undertaken some of the searches. So we're really at the point where there's nothing to lose. And this was not about suggesting to Michael Atkins what might have happened. It was about um, stripping away distraction and allowing him to really have that focus and concentration. To, was, it, was there anything else that perhaps a smell, you know, sometimes smell can yeah. trigger a memory, um, you know, about wind at the time. So if you're talking someone through from the very beginning and you're allowing that free recall and the questioning is not in any way leading or suggesting, it's about, and that's why words are very carefully chosen so that you're not implying an answer when you want it to be free recall. So mm. um, it, that just, I guess, to clarify, yeah, we weren't hypnotising him. It was about trying to allow the relaxation, allow, um, you know, maximising, um, minimising other distractions and maximising the content of, of what he could legitimately remember. So, yeah, it was th- this entire investigation, I suppose, was filled with different creative strategies from everyone involved mm. to try and look, this is a situation we haven't encountered before. What's the best we can bring in terms of creative strategies and 
and I know it's diverting a little bit, but, you, you know, you mentioned before about the need to um, not necessarily build rapport. Sometimes that's effective. Sometimes it's it's not. But that need to have that non-judgmental attitude. Mm. And with someone like what we had come to understand about Michael Atkins, that was important because he sort of compartmentalised his life and that tied in with what I had been advising council assisting as well. And, to, and so I come back to, you know, the belief obviously uh, um, that that tussle of ha- had this also involved murder or not. Um, and, you know, that's something, you know, so obviously the family have strong beliefs on that and I totally respect that and that's probably something mm. we'd never know. But it, from my perspective, it wasn't about that. It, well, it doesn't matter what my opinion might be on that. It was about what, is he going to respond on the stand to being called a murderer? Um, and I felt no. I felt that sometimes you need to facilitate someone to give an alternative um, uh, version of an event, yeah. whether that's truth- truthful or not, um, allow them to potentially save face perhaps if they don't. And that ties back to the criminal identity stuff I talked about earlier. Um, for the ultimate goal of where is Matt? Yeah. So if, if there and, – and in an offender's mind, sometimes there will be this hierarchy of that's – the most terrible crime, I can't be known to be that, but I can be known to be this, that I can cope with. Yeah. So sometimes it's about sacrificing whether that is the truth or not about mm. that because ultimately the truth that we need is where yeah. is Matt's body and that was everyone's and ultimate it, it, priority. It is, and you touch on that using all different uh, different techniques and sometimes you've got to think outside side the square, but I know uh, you feel the same same way and the, that, uh, the pain that... Uh, Matt's family, Mark mm. and Faye, and the, his brothers had been going through was just horrendous. And uh, if in any way we've helped, I, I, yeah, it's something we can walk away and go, yeah, that that was that was worthwhile. Absolutely, I I adore the Leversons. They they um, it was a privilege to be a part of their lives for that period of time, yeah. and it was such a prolonged thing that. You know, we kind of felt like we knew Matt as well. and Most definitely. And, but they were also such um, an inspiring family, and particularly the efforts that Mark and Faye had gone to and not wanting to leave that struggle to their other boys. Yeah. And, and Jason, Pete, you know, we, we had a lot of time with them as well, and it was fantastic to see how that family supported each other and and got through the most horrendous things. But we had a lot of humour with them as well, and we yeah. spent so much time with them down in the bush. Um, most of the humour was at your expense, but, you know, whatever yeah, where, gets where you was through the, the day. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'd actually met them a few years prior because they were very involved with the Attorney General's Department, Families and Friends of Missing Persons, yeah. and I had done a presentation there, and they had come to approach me about that case and... Um, and I, that had really stuck with me. They wouldn't remember that. It was a, a long time yeah. ago. But that really stuck with me. And, you know, you wonder what's happening. You can't insert yourself in an investigation. We need yeah. to be invited. And it's not always necessary. But I, I remember when you called me and said, I'm in charge of the reinvestigation this yeah. matter. And I, and I was like, I've heard about this case. I, and I've, heard yeah. about, I've heard about Matt. And I'm really happy to be invited onto it. Yeah, well, it was a privilege to help him in uh, any, way we, any way we could. And, and you... Um, Certainly gave uh, Scott and myself and the rest of the strike force confidence that we weren't, uh, yeah, weren't being strung along. So mm. that was uh, that was a very interesting case. I want to move on to uh, another case, but before I do, I just want to talk about one thing, and because uh, I I don't think we should sit down in the room and uh, do a podcast without mentioning it because it was very funny. <laughs> um, an investigation we won't even name the investigation. Um, it had us. Uh, well, we worked. Well, I had travel overseas for the investigation and uh, then we're doing an operation in uh, interstate and because we're not mentioning the operation we can yeah tell it tell it the way it is <laughs> this is a police operation so everything the public might think about a police operation in summary we had an informant <laughs> meeting with us you're laughing well in, just yeah it just all funny. went out the window didn't it in uh, a summary we had a um uh, an informant meeting with a suspect and uh, the informant was fairly soft personality, and again, I was seeking your advice on that, but we needed the informant to be fairly strong in what he was going to confront the suspect with. And uh, we had, as police operations play out, and I'm not giving methodology away because it's played out on TV, we were sitting in the back of a uh, a, a white van, and uh, <laughs> we're listening to the informant that we'd uh, spent a great deal of time, yeah, 
preparing him for uh, what he had to uh, had to do, and he 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 agreed. He was doing it of his own uh, own. He volunteered absolutely, and uh, he was doing his best. But he was very soft, and uh, we're sitting in the back of the uh, back of the uh, police van, and uh, we're listening to the first time that he spoke to the suspect, and uh, he just avoided the topic that he was meant to uh, meant to raise. That brought him the. That first part of the operation stopped, and uh, we bought him. and We're, we're seeing him in a shopping uh, shopping centre car park at night in a van. And I remember we got him back in, and uh, I had a word with him in your presence, and just you know, can we toughen up a little bit and just go a little bit harder because it's quite important that you've got to put yeah you know, certain things to him. Yeah. Without dictating exactly what he had to say, but just what he had to have a general discussion about. And then we went back to the van and we're sitting in the van and it's like you would picture it with headphones and everyone's sitting there listening intensely why uh, why this meeting takes mm. place. And lo and behold, the informants choked even even worse. And sometimes <laughs> as an operational Poor police thing. officer, you've got to make a decision. And it was, in, it was at night, it was a Saturday night in a major city in, uh, let's liken it to say Oxford Street in, in Sydney on a, on a Saturday night. And the informant's meeting with this uh, person of interest and <laughs> he's missed the point again. So we had to get a message to him, but we couldn't phone him because obviously it's a covert operation. I'm looking around. I needed someone that uh, could help me and you. <laughs> and I think this is outside your job <laughs> <Lucky> description. <me. laughs> Happened to be sitting in the van. And I said, I need you. What are we doing? Don't worry, I'll explain on the way down. And we were sitting about a couple of hundred metres. I said, we're going to stand right beside where the informant is uh-huh. speaking to the suspect and we're going to have a huge argument where I'm going to try to surreptitiously get across to the informant. He needed to toughen up and ask the hard questions. That's right. And it was particularly relevant because one of the keywords we'd asked the source to remember was ultimatum. He had to give this person an ultimatum. <laughs> and, and so you've got, to, you've got to keep it in a nutshell because you can't overwhelm them. You know, they're, they're doing something voluntarily and it's a big task. It's a big ask. So it was about the keyword ultimatum. Uh, that, that's right. So we've got down there and uh, we've decided to have an argument, like a domestic argument in the middle of the street, in the middle of a city. <laughs> right beside the informant and the suspect in the hope that the informant would understand when you're yelling at me about ultimatums. <laughs> you said to me something like, well, what have you got to say? Just spit it out. And I yelled back, what? You mean like an ultimatum? We were hoping that would trigger the a memory thing that, the of the thing task. That, the thing that worried me about that, you enjoyed abusing me too much. It was an operation, but you seemed to enjoy it. And it got to the point where people were stepping in to break up our domestic <laughs> argument and we had to abandon the uh, abandon the operation. But it does make me laugh because it was a uh, strange uh, scenario. It, it was. It, it's was definitely not in my role description. Um, it, you, you didn't exactly talk it out first. There wasn't time. And that was one of the really creative things that you did. And, and we had to try and trigger this person to remember um, what they were doing. And I must say, it was quite cathartic. It's not often you get the chance to, to let off a bit of stress and yell at a detective chief inspector. It was fun. But I also remember... You can apologise now. I, went, you, I think you went too far. <laughs> right. Sorry. Yes. I probably yeah. throw you an apology. There was one point where you started to stride away from me and I pulled back on your arm. Yeah. And when we went round the corner after it was finished, you said to me, oh, that was really authentic when you hit me. That was great. I said, I did not hit you. Can I just clarify? <laughs> I was trying to stop you walking away. It was all part of the Yeah. Well, when the, when the memory of the public started to step in, I thought this is getting getting out of hand, and I, I didn't know how to explain. No, I'm not really arguing. We're actually on a murder investigation. There but, was a uh, purpose. Yes. Yeah, that, that's uh, a part of the yeah. You know, when we talk about the the heavy stuff, but you've got to have times where you do, can have a bit of a laugh of uh, situations the way they happen. Yeah. But talking about uh, heavy stuff, and this is an investigation that's impacted on on both of us, and it's an investigation that that's still unsolved, and it's before the coroner. So we'll we'll talk in a general sense, not specific. Specific, but um, the uh, William Tyrrell case, mm. um, I'm, I'm sure most people are aware of it, the three-year-old uh, boy that was uh, abducted at uh, Kendall on the mid-north coast of New South Wales and uh, years and years ago now, but uh, it, it hasn't been solved. But uh, you were consulting on that before I became involved in, in the investigation. Um, Hans Rupp, who was running the investigation prior to myself, had um, sought your uh, assistance. And then I took over the investigation sort of five months into the investigation and uh, certainly 
embedded you deeply into the investigation because it was one of those difficult ones and it was obvious from the starters hands uh, identified and I, I certainly concurred with it was going to be a difficult investigation they're the type of investigations where I think input from someone as qualified as yourself really helps uh, a, an investigative team there was no um, uh, physical evidence in regards to um, William's abduction. There was no witnesses. So it was always going to be a, be a difficult one. So mm. to actually solve the investigation, and I, I've said this publicly, so this is not um, talking out of school, you, you virtually need a confession or you need to find evidence linking a person to William's disappearance, a physical exhibit or, or something along, along those lines. Mm. One of the roles that I had had you do was make an assessment of the uh, the crime scene because it's a fairly unique crime scene in that it's a small country town. It was a dead end street. But what was your interpretation of um, a three year old child disappearing from that location mid morning on a, a weekday morning? Mm. Well, it's it's a very rare event anyway. Thankfully, the uh, you know suspected abduction of a of a young child and certainly that geographic location is very unexpected as well. Um, I've worked on other abduction matters, child abduction matters, and in some cases it has been a very impulsive act um, and the person has been driving past and, and spotted an opportunity. So, yeah, there were certainly challenges in terms of um, the atypical nature of a child of, of William's age at that time as well. Um, going missing. So initially, and that was, a, you know, it's another example, and, and obviously we're only speaking generally because it's it's still under investigation, but, you know, you're looking at, a, a, again, it's hypothesis testing and it's looking at, um, it goes back again to the research. What do we know empirically about um, patterns when a child has disappeared? And it's a missing person assessment. And I talked previously about psychological autopsy and that um, typically in that process you have a, a cause of death and, and indeed you have a deceased. That A similar process can be applied but um, to a missing person. So you obviously don't know that they're deceased and so you obviously don't have a cause of death because you don't know that that's actually occurred. But it can be a similar assessment. So you're weighing up a number of variables and whether there is you know, more evidence. It's all about probabilities, of course. It doesn't um, give a, a definite outcome, but it's weighing up the different probabilities of... Um, does this look like abduction? Does this look like an accident? Does this look like, uh, you know, he's wandered off and got lost? Does it look like familial involvement? So it's about hypothesis testing and, and going back to the literature and what tells us about typical patterns when a three-year-old goes missing. Mm. And and looking at that, gathering that data and that uh, that type of information, how I'm just trying to get a sense of how you actually process process that yourself I, I've seen it because I've seen the reports that you do but what what do you factor in uh, when you're ma making your assessment because you're always and you're very careful of saying it may be or there's mm. you, it's not a definitive this is what's happened clearly the child has been abducted blah 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 but you weigh it all up assess yep. the area determine the, the crime scene and then come to your conclusion that's right I'd be doing a disservice in the investigation if I was talking in absolutes that's not and that's not how psychology works generally so it is about saying look if it's, it's assessing the different scenarios it's not saying yep yeah, it was definitely this but it's saying look if um, if this was stranger abduction for sexual motive what are the typical trends that we're looking at and uh, so it comes back to well, typically in that scenario it's typically an older child. You might be, you know, over five. You might be looking more at that eight to 12, even up to 15. Typically in terms of, you know, the data that we have, um, that's more likely what you're looking at. If it's a stranger um, abduction and it's a sexual motive, then um, the younger the child, so to have somebody who's a three-year-old, that's a very specific interest on the part of that sex offender. So if that has been perpetrated by a sex offender, that's a specific age range. And, and some of my research and other cases um, gave me the experience to look at victim selection patterns as well. So, and part of the psychology, I think, um, I know I'm probably sidetracking here, but I think that's where the value of psychology is it, it, 
the patterns and the empirical data only takes you so far. Yep. And then it's a very individualised assessment because even if you have a serial offender, every single victim offender interaction within that serial crime with the same offender is different. And there are situational factors that come into that as well. So y- you have those patterns and empirical data that is uh, that there that's the foundation but then we're looking from that going okay so if it's a sexual motive and it's a stranger abduction then if they have abducted a three-year-old if that is a very specific age interest um typically you might see more age variability when there is an older child so you might if, if it's a serial offender for example there might um they might sexually offend against eight 10, 12 year olds, there might be more variability there. But you tend to see the younger the victim, the more specific the victim selection preferences are um, in terms of gender and age. Uh, Gender tends to be a more stable um, preference for a sexual offender. Um, Not always though, and that there's always a proportion that um, will cross those kind of boundaries and that's where it can be useful as well because detectives might have some blinkers on there in terms of, oh, this person only likes you know, young boys or something, they might have some female offenders, uh, female victims as well. But those preferences tend to be, um, uh, there are certain patterns about it. Gender may not be so specific a preference when they're below 10. Some sex offenders have said, look, you know, pre-puberty didn't really matter to me whether it was a girl yeah. or a boy. So those preferences as the person gets, is, is an older age, come into play in terms of what our expectations may be. And again, the the literature and the data about sex offender behaviour patterns, that's important. But as I said, it only takes you so far because they're so varied and there are a range of underlying motives behind their sexual offending, different ranges of um, sexual fantasy that may or may not be behind their offending, Mm. different levels of cognitive distortions, which is the term that basically means thinking errors that that offender has that support their offending. But also I, I would be looking at things like did the offender, if this was an impulsive sexual crime um, and a stranger abduction, did they actually realise his age? You also have to think about how does this child or this victim look to the offender? And that can sometimes be a confusing factor because they might think that they're only, you know, that their interest might be 12 to 15 mm. year olds, but then they, they attack an eight year old. And if it's a, a serial crime, that can throw the investigation off a bit because, like, we've got a different victim well, type. One, one of the, because countless hours, I, I, yeah, in, in the hundreds of hours we've discussed this case when we're working, working on it. And, uh, one of the things that really uh, stuck with me, and uh, I know that we, we had some full-on discussions about it because the, the pressure uh, is on, as I'm sure it's on with the, the police continuing to work on, on the investigation. You made a comment that uh, yeah, the offender mightn't even know why they've committed this offence. Mm-hmm. And you also made the point that you know, the public are looking for the creepy pedophile type person when a child is abducted but it mightn't even relate to that and Mm. that's that type of information you give me that's not yeah it's not specific information but it makes us open the investigation up that uh yeah the people and i think just the perception is if a child's been abducted it's a pedophile and Mm. yeah a lot of times it it, it possibly is but Mm. you open my mind up to other other factors that uh yeah if someone's involved in it the person involved in it may not even know why they're or fully understand yeah yeah, why there might be triggering events as well but um and again that that can tie in with what some of their cognitive distortions might be Mm. as well they might not be able to absolutely explain it i mean they, they they will have their own reasons, but you know from a psychological standpoint, they might not really be able to to explain it. And with very young children, um, you know statistically, it's it's more more likely to be. You have to rule out other um, hypotheses as well, or rule them in in terms of are there red flags in terms of familial involvement or that accident scenario. I mean, typically yeah. that that under five age group, um, that's more what you're looking at. So it's a process of constant hypothesis testing as new information comes in, and then we're evaluating. You know that that area for a three-year-old you know they don't seem that they're going to willingly wander terribly far there but we also um, were told from the beginning you know there was an extensive search of that sort of one kilometer um, area around and so you're, you're having to go off that as best you can but then you're also looking at 
because of the, um, and again, this isn't criticism, but because of the, the the need to find this child as quickly as priority. possible, yeah. that's the priority. And also there were the community coming to help, it wasn't just police. So police may know to consider all possibilities when they're also searching, but SCS and other, you know, the community volunteers who mm. did, had an amazing response to try and find um, a child and somebody like William as well, you know, are they looking for a lost child or are they looking as well for a potentially concealed body? You know, you, yeah. you, all of those questions come out of it as well. And, and, I guess- and the reality is 99% of the time the child is found. Yeah, yeah. You, you, the right. child uh, child disappears with extensive uh, searches like that. But yeah. there's all sorts of factors, and we talked about. And again, we're talking in a general sense, so we're not, um, yeah, talking specifically, but about uh, people who may ingratiate themselves in the investigation. I've seen that during my uh, my career. That mm-hmm. uh, these are another thing that uh, we talk about. Mm. I also uh, worked with you on because we had them again public. Uh, it's publicly known there was hundreds of um, persons of interest, um, high risk, medium risk, low risk, mm. and uh, I talked to you about how we could put those in those categories just to make sense of the chaos that it was, the sheer volume of information that came in, but also helped me assess um, suspects when we we targeted suspect to interpret what was going on, and there was one particular uh, suspect that had. Uh, some very strange, and this is something that yeah hasn't played out in the public, but uh, so it's not anyone that they they think they they might know. But very strange behaviours. Where, mm. from a detective's point of view, I'm looking and thinking this could very well you know, as you've said, and I, I I'm not sure if I stole the the line from you or if it's just a general <laughs> thing. But red flags. Yep. There's a lot of red flag indicators there. Yeah. And I remember when we sat down and interviewed uh, this person, or I interviewed uh, interviewed the person, and uh, we were very curious of, as what he would say when we dropped snippets of information that we knew about him and about his behaviour. And he had a what I would say. How would I put this? The response, he readily admitted what mm. he'd done and mm. gave explanation mm-hmm. that from my layman's point of view would say, that's insane what he just said. But he believed it and we assessed it from there and he was one of the people that we um, decided to um, de-escalate and eliminate him on the basis that we'd properly explored that. That's right. And it, and it's challenging when you don't then have, because typically it's about prioritising um, persons of interest to focus on and and looking for inculpatory or exculpatory yes. um, information. So um, something that, you know, in layman's terms might rule them in or out. And then you're, you're seeking the, the physical evidence that, that might confirm that as well. So without that physical evidence, yeah, absolutely, it's, it's, it's limited to how can we assess the information they're giving us or the, the, the strategies you've got in place to extract that information. So, and, and I recall that, and, and it's a matter of assessing each. This is not just focusing on one, it's assessing it, and it's not just with you, it's with the whole team as well, um, the different persons of interest mm. that they're each investigating and looking at these things look, you know, on the surface and initially, yep, there are a number of red flags there, but the psychological evaluation can then help you structure the police interview so that the information that's received there and then when I then evaluate that as well it's helping yourself or the other detectives determine okay that that's specific to we think there are some um, it wasn't it wasn't about serious mental illness as such but that you know some personality features there and that really does explain it and also in terms of his particular routine and habits and and looking at, at as much information as we could get about his background those things can be put in a context where they're not they're not the concern that mm. they initially seem to be in relation to that particular disappearance. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's about evaluating that, and it and it doesn't you know it's not a hundred percent, but it's it's giving a really good, um, reasonable and reliable evaluation of the. This is how this reasoning can show that that person is a much lower priority now. Well, I know it, it helped uh, helped the team when we were investigating because you could add that uh, evaluation and science to it. Like mm. we might say, yeah, it just my gut feeling is it's not him because of the way he reacted. But yeah. that doesn't carry much favour if you're giving evidence at the coroner's court no. or, or whatever, <laughs> or, or any court. Oh no, I just didn't think it was him. But you can add some science to it, and that's the type of skill set that you bring with the training that you've got mm, would you agree with mm. that that you you have got 
let's say, the big words, but also an understanding <laughs> of why we've come into that conclusion. Yes, it has to be, uh, and I think I said before, you know, it comes back to those definitions of what is a profile and what are the other techniques and what is its purpose because it, it has to be reasoned, it has to be supported by all the, the material that you've reviewed, all the evidence that was before you. And, that has, and that's why I would sometimes give you some very lengthy reports and I'm quite sure you didn't read them, but I'd make sure I summarise it nicely in the final paragraph. <laughs> but it's about so that if that needs to be explored, well, what is that? opinion based on all of that evidence that supports that is there and that's why i call it you know it is still the the structured professional um uh, judgment as as per forensic psychology best practice standards and it's it's also it goes back to um those definite and what is the purpose of it because when it is a profile that's required the purpose is to help progress the investigation and some of the criticisms that had been directed at profiling as a field um not psychology specifically, but profiling as a field was, oh, well, it, you know, it doesn't stand up in court. Well, yeah. my reaction to that was, well, there's a whole lot of forensic psychology going on that has no, you know, you know purpose being in the court. It's not for that. This is not yeah. evidence. This is not identifying a person. It's saying this is a tool to help you get to the next point or prioritise those persons of interest. Um, and I also, I remember reading... Um, it was a psychologist had written, uh, there was a quote that said, well, name me one case where the profile has solved it and then I'll believe in it. And I thought, well, that to me shows a lack of understanding about yeah. how it works operationally because it doesn't solve the case. And it's, it is a tool that can be used to help progress it and, and either confirm a line of inquiry or maybe generate alternative lines of inquiry. So, yeah, it comes back to that in, in any technique that is applied, but it's about what we empirically know about offenders, what we empirically know about what typically explains the disappearance of a young child, as it was in that case, um, and what is absolutely everything that we can do to show that there is no stone left unturned in mm. trying to find um, William and what's happened to him. And that is that misconception that, that uh, people think we're, repl we're trying to present it as evidence. It's the mm. way that uh, we work together in, in the times and the investigations we worked on. You're helping you value adding to the investigation by adding your expert opinion on mm -hmm. um on what direction we should go uh, go in that's right and you know there've also been concerns raised in the past um you know in, in the literature i'm talking mm -hmm. uh about you know can it can a profile mislead an investigation well if the profile contradicts um the forensic evidence yeah. then you throw the profile out of course and and uh, anyone who is who is doing that work, who is adequately trained and experienced, this was something that Roy would say all the time as well. Yeah. You know, he was one of the biggest critics of it in that sense of, I mean, he was a profiler, but you have to understand the limitations of it and you have to explain the limitations of it as well. And And I've had cases where actually the information that was put to me initially and I was doing a crime analysis and I was told, um, by the detectives that, and they were excellent detectives, and they did an incredible job on this really significant case. I won't go into which one it was, but I was originally told um, this isn't a typical profile because we've been told by forensics that there are two offenders, there are two different mm. shoe prints in in blood at that scene. So then it was more a crime analysis. You can, if you if you're doing a criminal profile, you need to be confident there's one offender, otherwise, which behaviours do you attribute to yeah, which personality? Yeah. So, uh, but it was a similar kind of process and evaluating the nature of the violence and all of the things from the from what we know empirically and what we know experientially about um, violent crimes and and who was the like you know what type of person, what relationship to the victims might they have, and I, through that detailed process, so I had to approach it as though there were two, and I, it throughout that report, I kept coming back to. The biggest, the biggest challenge to this analysis is um, that I have been told that the, the crime scene evaluation is that there are two offenders. That's the biggest inconsistency that I have. Everything else is pointing to this, that and the other. However, if that is um, the case, then obviously you would progress the investigation on that basis. Mm -hmm. And it came back later, as can you know, unfortunately happen, uh, people are responding to a really significant murder and one of the shoe prints was one of their responding police officers. Yeah. So it was actually only one offender and that fit with everything that I had evaluated about. But I wouldn't say to them, throw out that while it was the forensic evidence and that was very early days of the case. And yeah. so that's later found, as can sometimes happen, to not be the case. So it is a moving beast. But yeah. it was the one point that was inconsistent to me in the crime in terms of everything that the behaviour told us about the likely motives of the offender, that it was 
far more likely to be a single offender. But they would never, and I would never encourage them to go with a profile if the forensic evidence tells you different. You've got to back yourself. And quite often, uh, I, whether it's myself or I hear other detectives being asked, do you trust your instinct and, mm. uh, and that? And I say, I listen to my instinct, yeah. but that's only pointing me in the direction, then I've got to overlay that with the facts of the case. Yes. That, 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 and I think that's very similar to what we, we're talking about with the work that you provide, that call it instinct with me. You've got a science behind it, which would obviously turn into instinct after the years that you've, you've worked on it. But mm. it's got to be corroborated with the facts as they present themselves. Absolutely. And there can be a tendency for, you know, we're all human. We're all going to think, would I respond like that? Would I do that? How would I, if that question was put to me, would I be mm. like that? But that's not us. It's not us that we're evaluating. It's not ourselves. We haven't got that background. We haven't got those triggering events. We don't have that situational context or, um, you know, the genetic factors perhaps that contribute or, the, you know, the upbringing that that person had or whatever combines or the cognitive distortions that they have yeah. that prompts that person to commit that offence. So you, you have to let the gut feeling go to a certain... You have to yeah. listen to it, as you say, that instinctive... Because the instinct sometimes is also based on 20 years of yeah. experience. Yeah. So it's not something to just be dismissed either, but you have to tease out what's coming from experience and what's just coming from my reaction. Okay. Another uh, comment that I, I make is that um, with uh, in investigations about uh, trying to put a rational mind behind a horrendous crime, like we, we'll mm. go to a crime scene and it's absolutely horrendous and they'll we'll be... None, just general conversation, whether it's a formal briefing, informal, the way detectives talk. And uh, quite often they hear people saying, but they wouldn't do this because they're trying to put... I'm, I'm saying the act in itself was irrational, so don't try and put a rational... your rational thought process, how you would react after that. Is that... Mm. Am I on track there or...? Yeah, I see what you're saying. And... and or people can feel... And you know, there's a, you know, in terms of definitions of insanity, or you know, whether if an offender has a, a serious mental illness yeah. that's behind their offending, that's that's a different um, a different thing. But certainly, some of the uh, the most complex, I guess, that where psychology can add the most value are the most complex, most deviant mm. type um, offences because of the richness of the behavioural evidence that's there to evaluate. So, like I said before, drive-by shooting, you know, you've got one behaviour to analyse yeah. and that's a challenge in the William Tyrrell disappearance as well because where are the behaviours to analyse? Yeah, <laughs> you that's... haven't really got very many. So, um, so yeah, it comes back to the richness of the, of the behaviour and so where it is very complex, that can seem to the layperson as they're insane or they must be crazy to do that. It can actually be very calculated. It's, it's, it may be addressing their specific um, deviant sexual interests. Um, you know, there, there may not be, you know, an emotion behind it, not, not a mental illness behind it. And I've also had cases where I remember um, it was a murder case and the detective in charge was saying to me, you know, it, it, it was at trial and they were saying, I think the jury is really struggling to see how this nice, clean-cut, seemingly normal person could have committed... Um, that family violence and mm. it was in the, it was a murder in the familial context and I was discussing with him well that murder served a particular purpose for him he, mm. he doesn't need to be it's got nothing to do with you know he didn't even have a parking ticket or you know yeah. driving offenses he didn't need to be he didn't have a drug history or any of that it, this served a particular purpose and then in his mind that's done you yeah. know so it, you I wouldn't have an expectation of him necessarily ever committing a crime again, you know, but... but Because that it circumstances was, wouldn't present themselves. That's that, right, exactly. Yeah. So. You, you helped me on an investigation. I won't mention the, the specific investigation, but it was a serial killer. And uh, because the victims weren't the same type, um, as in uh, gender and uh, age, and people had... Uh, I, I was linking the crimes together and people were um, making the comment that uh, it just doesn't seem like a serial killer because they're different victims. And uh, I had you look at the investigation and you came up with something that uh, served me well in uh, working on the investigation. You identified that the suspect for this or the person of interest for this matter is not motivated by killing. He was sexually motivated to uh, mm -hmm. uh, commit a sexual offence and he's prepared to kill to satisfy that need or if, if he has to, to get, a, get away with what he was doing. Um, mm -hmm. 
Is that a case that uh, happens very often, that, that type of thing? Like we can interpret, uh, interpret, and it doesn't happen very often, and we know that we don't have that many serial killers, but sometimes mm. you're looking, I, I was looking that, okay, he's killing these people, he must be driven by intent to murder but it was actually the sexual desire that in mm. leading up to the murders yeah no you're right it doesn't happen very often but th- th- it does happen sometimes even if it's not a serial case um, yep. but yeah it, it is about identifying what is the primary um, motive on, on the offender's part mm. and um, because some of the behaviours that come out in in that um, scene or in those actions that they've taken can it's called behavioural leakage, basically. It can indicate other interests that they may have or other um, skills that they have as an offender as well, and that can give you some of the information about how criminally sophisticated they are, what their background might be, other offences that they may have been involved in. So in, in the case that you're referring to, yeah, it, it was it came across very much as primarily sexually motivated crimes. And in some cases, especially with a serial killer case, the the murder will typically be an ingrained part of the sexual offending. It might be because it's just their way of eliminating the witness. It might be because the actual act of murder is what's gratifying and, and mm. satisfying for them. But in, in that particular case, no, the, the murder was kind of a necessity to the sexual motive, yes. if that makes sense. And that is what accounts for sometimes the um, inconsistencies in victim selection because people can be focused on murder victim here is different to murder victim here is different to, you know, however many murder victims. And it's 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 more about, yes, but why? Were they the primary victim targeted for the sexual motive? Well, your, your information ser- served me well in that it opened my eyes up, but it, it also with all the uh, informed legal people I was speaking to, that was quite often the first question and mm. then I'd say well have a look at this report and that might give you mm. an understanding and it really uh, really provided answers but you've got some expertise in, in part of your studies and uh, in your uh, training with uh, sexual offenders mm. and what is it about sexual offenders that the, the, the predators and the the serial nature of the way they they offend or tend to offend well, it's it's a very complex area and it would probably take <laughs> quite a long time to sort of explore all of that. But I wouldn't ask for a report from you because no, it would be a very long report. <laughs> and you wouldn't read it. <laughs> I always read the summary. You know how it's sure. big on this? No, what I always read the What does this mean for me? And that's, I, I think that's that, the like all purpose. jokes aside, and I, yep. I do understand it, that because it is such a um, diverse way of looking at things, mm. your reports did have to be long. Mm. Um, but... Sometimes during the operational phase of it, I just needed give me the give me the crunch line. But exactly. I did, I did read your reports. And, no, I know, and and that's what that's just you know that's a professional practice that needs to be there. But um, that is also it's a reference point. Should you know the strike force need to go back and and remind themselves of different things? I think it's also important to stand by your opinion and have it in writing, of course. But it, that verbal interaction being part of the strike force and those discussions, so that you can give that immediate practical. Okay, that's great. You think. A, B, and C about this guy, but what does that mean for me? What does that yeah. mean for this strategy? And in terms of yeah, you know, sexual offending, I guess f- from an operational perspective, you know, it, it, it's important. For, and this this would play out in a lot of the training that I would give police and other aligned um, investigative organisations. It's about understanding how they differ and how, um, you know, even somebody who offends against children, you know, they're not all the same as each other either. Mm. And you can have quite situational offenders and sometimes police will will have the view that, oh, every time you, you catch someone for a sexual crime, it's never their first time. They've obviously done it before. That's That's not frequently not mm. the case or that they're definitely going to um, commit another sexual crime frequently not the case yep. so it's about understanding you know th- is this person a preferential offender do they have that kind of specialized that criminal identity again they're a sexual offender that is their primary motive they might also steal some things from the victim but again it comes back to what's the primary motive is it theft is it sexual offense which one was the the added advantage for them in that in that particular mm. crime um uh yeah it, it it it's a complex field but also it has been use it had been useful on the operational side as well because offenders as you would know can be very judgmental about other offenders yeah. and um certain people you know there is a bit of a hierarchy as well in terms of um 
who kind of has a bit of street cred in the particular pecking, types. Pecking order. Yeah, pecking yeah. order amongst offenders. But that can even be the case within sex offenders as well. And, yeah. and you know, some of them will will sort of say, okay, yes, look, I'll admit that um, I offended against a child, but it wasn't my own child. I mean, that's really sick. Or somebody yeah, else okay. will say, well, yes, but it was, it, it was a 12-year-old, but it wasn't a 5-year-old, you know. So th- those kind of judgments mm. can be... And that ties in with the cognitive distortion side as well, and that can be useful for um, interviewing and people to tap into those kind of judgments that they hold, and that can be quite informative. The uh, I, I think it was, it, you've said informative, and uh, how informative you have been. I think the people that are listening will get a sense of what you know, what a mind hunter is, or a profiler, <laughs> or a forensic psychologist. It I'm just a forensic psychologist. Doesn't yeah. sound as exciting as mind hunter, or uh, yeah, sorry, a, a that's the reality. Profile. But <laughs> I, I think you've given a very good understanding. I've got to ask this question of you, but uh, delving into all this darkness, how do you deal with it? That that's a good question, um, and it's. It's, I suppose it's something I have reflected on on occasion during my career because on the one hand, I'm not um, intensely involved with, you know, the families of victims um, or the victims themselves of sexual assault matters, etc., as the police are. So I'm kind of the, – the role was always in that slightly detached fashion and I'd be reviewing a lot of the investigative material and statements and all of that. So I – you know, I was able to operate at that kind of slightly detached. You have to sort of compartmentalise to a certain extent and go, okay, these are really traumatic, difficult, horrendous things that have happened to people mm. um, and to people's loved ones. But I have to feel that, you know, I have to feel, okay, but I, I, I might be able to do something here to help. I can't stop what's happened you know this has already happened but maybe I can contribute to some kind of resolution so I would view it like that and um yeah it's just like any 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 professional you have to have some boundaries in place with that Mm. and um and you know you talk to your colleagues you 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 vent and you debrief about things and if people need it they, they seek other avenues of support but I always found I was always so motivated um to, with the work that I was doing, I absolutely loved every minute of the casework that I did, mm. and and I found that very rewarding. And I thought if 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 the work that I do is some small part um, in progressing that case, then then I've done something worthwhile. Yeah, oh, that, that's interesting, and I, I can certainly attest to that. That mm. uh, the input that you provide to investigations across the board have, uh, have have been helpful. Is it a career that you would recommend to other people? Because I know it's a real interest, um, the that psychology of the, the criminal. Is your career path, is it something you'd recommend? Yeah, look, it's it's it has changed a lot over the, the decades, really. Um, yeah. I'm feeling very old, but I've, I've been doing this for a couple of decades. You've done a lot um, for a 25-year-old. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. This is why I look so tired. Um, <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And, and there's a lot of interest in forensic psychology generally, and there yeah. are a lot more opportunities these days than yeah. there were originally. A lot of, um, as I said, operational psychology is not just specific to forensics. It, it, it's specific to a whole range of other um, operational work um, that's really fascinating. And also these days there is a lot more available for the forensic side of that in, in you know, um, federal agencies and intelligence agencies and defence related activities as well where yeah. that kind of um, the personality profiling stuff and interviewing strategies is also Risk very relevant yeah that's right so um, there, I think there are a lot more really fascinating opportunities it's funny when you ask that question I, I'm reminded I, I was uh, in, a, in a workshop a couple of months ago and there was another psychologist psychologist there and we were sitting around a table with a few psychologists and um, that's just a having scary a- thought <laughs> How many psychologists does it take yeah. to change a light bulb? Yeah. Only one, but the light bulb's got to want to change. No, um, I don't know how I <laughs> got to that. But anyway, so um, yeah, it does sound like the start of a bad joke, but there were a group of psychologists sitting around having lunch and w- they, w- they were talking about um, assisting with student psychologists and you know interns and, and doing student placements. And one of them said um, to her colleagues, oh, you know, and it's always funny when they say, oh, they want to do work on investigations and profiling work and they didn't know my background. Um, and, uh, you know, they sort of had a bit of a laugh. And, and that's something I felt, from, and I sort of thought, 
well, I won't say anything, but I mean, I did that for about 17, 18 years. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm still doing it on a, a consultancy um, uh, basis. So uh, I sort of thought, you know, there are those attitudes to, oh, that's not real mm. psychology or, you know, that's an American thing. And that's absolutely fine. That's just people haven't been exposed to it. It hasn't been part of, yeah. of their career path. But I, I would absolutely, forensic psychology as a field, absolutely. Well, I, I know the passion you had when you were with the New South Wales Police, how much you enjoyed it. And we, we would quite often talk about it, that, you know, how, what other job would you want to do when we were uh, on some of the tougher investigations? But you also, I, I, and I'd like to take this opportunity to apologise to you. I thought you were my own personal forensic psychologist. <laughs> Just, I thought every homicide detective got one, but apparently not. You were doing other work. Yeah, and and I I, I need to also acknowledge because the first um, couple of years I was I was the only psychologist, and then they they regraded the position um, to to senior specialist, and I had to reapply for my job. Uh, won that job, and then we were able to um, advertise the psychologist position. So we then selected um, Kimora, and I need to acknowledge yeah. her contribution to the team because you know for the bulk of that time, and every now and then we'd be on you know maternity leave and things like that and we'd have other um fantastic psychs come in to help but so for the bulk of the time it was two people so yeah. we you know and and it also broadened from it was originally set up primarily with that expectation because of the complexity of behaviors that that are needed to make the assistance worthwhile to be primarily focused on on um, homicides and sex crimes mm. and as i said before it was really driven by the field and i started to get those calls about oh this missing person but i think you know she she was depressed and psychology might be relevant um you know the counterterrorism it's side it's been came organic in. the way it's it, grown exactly it? and it's uh... covered you know arson offenses it, it's covered a whole range and the training aspect i really enjoyed a lot and um you know still continue that side as well because it's just it's fantastic to see the eyes open a little bit and have people yeah. come up later and say I never realized you know I've, I've worked so many of those cases but I never realized that that could mean this and those kind of comments are, um, it, it's fantastic to be Sat- part of satisfying and I look I'm, I'm probably still causing you work because I, I know that it was an interstate inquiry that came to me recently that uh, they were looking for some uh, expertise <laughs> that you carry and Maybe it was wrong of me, but I gave him your number, and I know, I know, I know you help help them out too. So that, that, that uh, was great. And it was, I think, it was intended to be a quick fifteen minute chat just to get a bit of a picture. And we spoke for nearly three hours. It was really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Sarah, thanks so much for coming on. I catch killers. As I've said, I've wanted to get you on here for a long time. Your insight into the crimes and the criminal minds have always fascinated me. It's such a dark world to make sense of, but you always manage somehow to shine some light on it. And your professionalism and dedication always came to the fore. I like to use you as a sounding board on some of the more difficult investigations I ran. It gave me the confidence that I was not missing anything. Quite often you'd challenge me or question me in regards to the strategy or direction of the investigation, which I appreciated because you looked at things from a different perspective and I think that added to the quality of the investigation. You've always displayed genuine empathy towards the victim, even sometimes the offenders where appropriate. Thanks again for your dedication and professionalism in a very challenging field of endeavour. You're a big loss to the New South Wales Police and I'm going to miss working with you. Oh my goodness, well I think that's that's overstating, but very, very kind thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure, any time. Next week on I Catch Killers, I'm going to talk with the family members of three murdered children from Barrowville. It's a case that is very dear to my heart and changed my view on the justice system and racism in society. See, these children were Aboriginal and because of that they were treated differently. I hope you tune in next week and hear the families talk about the pain of having their children murdered and what it's like to be ignored simply for the fact they were Aboriginal. See you next week on I Catch Killers.